Uh, welcome back, y'all. Well, we've got the 98 Jeep TJ back in the garage after its nearly two-year nap. It's been in hibernation for a bit. Uh, and after thousands of miles of adventure and its little hibernation period, uh, it's time to go through this thing and uh, give it some preventative maintenance and service. So we'll start from one end and work our way to the other, around top and bottom. And for starters, we already started doing a few things. Uh, we started with some spark plugs and getting around to some general maintenance and realized just how much we needed to change and what we needed to service after all that adventure and years of service. Where do we start? Should we start by crossing things off that we've already done? Probably. Make us feel better? Mm-hmm, absolutely. So spark plugs. Plugs. Steering. That's right. So we've already added, uh, well, replaced our tie rod ends and on the drag link. Uh, we already upgraded to new tires. Set of tires on. And we stayed with the same tires. These tires were awesome. They worked out really well. I didn't have any sidewall issues and uh, I'm probably going to now that I say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, these are Milestar Patagonia MTs um, and I ran them for thousands of miles. I don't know, 40,000 plus miles. And aired down, aired up, back and forth towing. It was awesome. They, they were quiet on the road and they performed really well. So we went with the same set of tires again in 35 by 1250 on 15-inch rims. So what's next? Uh, we have some new we springs. We got springs to add. That's been a challenge. Um, springs in general. This will be the fourth set of springs I'm on on the TJ, and it started with a real old school. Um, metal cloak kit. I think it was the old metal cloak uh, four inch lift kit and moved on through a few different springs, Terraflex springs. That's where we ran out for the majority of it. And then those got completely collapsed. Um, and right now it's sitting on some rock crawler uh, dual rate springs that also just didn't, not for what we're doing. In an unweighted Jeep, they're, they're fantastic. They ride great and they handle great on the trail. Um, but for all the weight that we've had, I mean, even adding back in our OG adventure days when this was just a relatively stock Jeep and we're throwing a cooler and a few different you know, camping accoutrements in, in the back, we've still got the Carolina squat going on. And <laughs> that's, it's just been a battle. I've tried spacers and overspringing and none of that works out well. You end up with a ton of rebound coming back up. Uh, any obstacle or any bump, it's shoving you back in the air. Um, so trying to address that, I found a company called Clayton Off-Road. And through as much research and uh, contacting a few different companies to find spring rates, uh, Clayton has, from what I can tell, the highest spring rate uh, pound per inch on springs uh, that I've found so far. So that'll be the next set to go in here at a four inch spring. And we'll see if we can get this thing to stay level. So once you're, once you're leaning back, it's not just that you're leaning, you're causing a bunch of other problems. You've got oiling issues in the engine. We're sitting at the wrong angles and driveline stress and um, lots of problems that come with that. So we'll see how that ends up Absolutely. <laughs> before going full custom and just figuring this out. So springs, and along with springs on the suspension, we're gonna to have to address joints. Um, so our control arm joints, we, when I originally set this up, um, after the lift kit that I purchased it with, I uh, used um, Heim joints, especially on the axle side. Uh, it worked out great, but man, does it transfer every bump into the cab. Uh, soon every single thing is a, a direct hit to the frame and it rattles like crazy. 
and you get a little bit of wander. There's a lot of oscillation in a hind joint. Um, so as the axle's moving and as you're traveling down the trail or down the highway specifically, you get some wander between the body and the axles. So we're gonna have to check out joints. And these are all drilled out to a little bit larger joints, including the uppers. So I've got to take some measurements for that and get some joints on order. So next after control arms, let's see what else for general maintenance here. Uh, we change all the fluids, uh, which I'll probably do again before we roll. Um, uh, fluids check in general. And unfortunately, when I pulled the transmission fluid, uh, I was running Redline MT90, and I don't think I'm a speed shifter. <laughs> it does have a short throw shifter in it, it has a B&M short throw shift, which is sweet. Probably my favorite modification to the whole thing. Um, which has nothing to do with this, but uh, I, there was a ton of gold flake in the fluid. So the synchros may have left the chat. And that will, I'm going to try flushing this fluid out again and giving it another treatment of Royal. Uh, we'll see how it shifts. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be looking at a transmission pretty quick, too. Uh, behind the transmission, though, the transfer case was relatively recent rebuild. It's still a 231J. It's got a slip yoke eliminator on it. Um, that's only got maybe five or 6,000 miles on it. So we'll just give that a fresh fluid change and ball should be well in there. We'll definitely check the diffs. Give that some dinosaur juice. Um, next, we have, <laughs> uh, we have a new manifold. Yeah, exhaust. Um, exhaust on this. Uh, this is a 98 Jeep TJ. So yeah, in this model, all six cylinders come into one collector. Uh, in the later models, they separate into two and two different cats. Um, but at that uh, collection joint, there's a few welds and it's just rigid and everything's shaking and vibrating on the trails. Those have cracked and I've welded them up and welded the cracks and it, we're, it just keeps cracking again. So that one, um, pull the intake off and get the exhaust on. Uh, with that exhaust, uh, I've also got a new Magnaflow muffler for the rear. I've been running their little, uh, I don't know, bullet kind of style muffler, kind of a straight through muffler with a turn down right before the rear axle. And uh, it's great, sounds sweet, but sure is it loud. Um, I got tinnitus from running this thing <laughs> on the road. <laughs> uh, so I got a little different style muffler and we'll see if that quiets, quiets it down a touch. That would be helpful. Uh, but that's quite the job uh, with this and the intake and the exhaust on the same side to share a gasket. So we'll pull that off and move on to that, getting in some exhaust gases out behind us. I'm not rattling so loud. What else is on here that we already know? Uh, the transmission mount. Trans mount, which I seem to tear through about every, I don't know, 20,000 miles or so. That's just a single mount. Um, there's no mount for the transfer case in these, so it's it's taken all the stress and all the torque when we're running in four low and, and just reduced all the time. And smacking on the highway all of it. So we'll change that trans mount. Get things rigid again. I'm what else do we think. got? Okay. Is that it for our major mechanical? Yeah, besides adding more water and then do we got to address some water concerns? Um, trying to stay sustainable out of this at our you know, gallon per person per day. We're pretty conservative in our water use as far as cleaning and things like that. Um, some other um, provisions or, or tools that we use for that, and even just a little spray bottle. And well, I'll explain that in the kitchen kit. Uh, but we still need more water and trying to situate that around the rig for proper weight distribution. So we've got, I think I got a cool trick for that. We'll check out later on. But I think that's pretty much it. For... That's it for the high line of things. Yeah. Well, let's dive around to the interior because I know that there's a few things there I got to address. And I'm moving on to the interior. Um, these are still the stock uh, Jeep TJ seats. 
I wrapped them in this, the Bartek seat covers, which held up beyond my expectations. Not sponsored, none of that, paid for them. But this is years out in the open elements, and they're still black as night. And they repelled water and went through it all. But after thousands of miles of adventure and my bony butt bouncing up and down in the seat, the springs are not sprung, and the foam has collapsed. So I need to do something about that. It's just I'm sitting all the way at the bottom and the seats are completely shot. So I don't know what to do there, whether I try refoaming it or try some aftermarket seats. I really like the rock and roll forward to be able to get into the back and see if I can keep that in some fashion. But we'll have to address that soon. And something else with a seat, heated seat. These are just cheapo uh, off Amazon seat heaters. And it worked out great. Uh, literally keeping the blood hot through my butt and then pumping it through the rest of my body because this hasn't also had heat uh, for a long time. I had to bypass the heater core somewhere in Utah, I think, a long time ago. So that's been the only form of heat we've had for years out of adventure out of this thing. But either a heated seat in some fashion or replacement seat and get another seat heater on here. Um... Also, I need to get a new shifter boot. I'm gonna rip the snot out of that. I think I've got something cool in mind for that one. I'm working on something out of leather. Other than that, our phone mounts. Um, we got new phones and uh, the, a bit larger phones. I've been using RAM mounts for a long time uh, and even flopped this Jeep on its side, also in Utah. Um, uh, Ashtray came dumping in my face, but the phone stayed mounted up there. So I'll go with them again. We just got to get a little bit larger mount. We use the same style mount for um, our iPad as well. And it's our navigation and everything that we run on there. Super solid mounts. And I use their cage wrap system. Uh, it's just a band clamp with a little mount around the roll cage in this. What else we have for interior? Probably need to go over the wiring. And give some of that a double check. Check all the lugs. Last thing I'd want is a loose lug, and then pff, there goes everything. So I'll have to give everything a little once over there. Uh, this does run dual batteries, so I've got one under the hood, and then also got leads running uh, to a battery that sits behind my seat. Uh, I don't have that isolated or anything. I haven't found a use for it. I grew up plowing snow. We just tied them together. I need the extra juice. Uh, and if I happen to run them too low, then I carry a little jump starter to clip onto the battery and jump start it. Or it's a manual, I can just push it. I guess moving around to the back. So in the back, is, we've had this Poison Spider tire carrier on for a while. And while it functions great, it's an awesome steel bumper. It's fantastic. The downside to using a, a swing-out tire carrier like this is that it leaves all of this weight from whatever's just packed in the trash roo and the weight of the oversized spare tire all hinged off of this one corner. So you get the TJ lean, chances are it's a tire carrier and all this weight is being hinged right here on this far corner. So that's got that weighed down. Uh, it's always gonna give it a little bit of a lean. So I don't know if it's worth it to switch over to something aluminum, cut some weight a little bit, and maybe a body mounted tire carrier, something to get that up and not all pivoted on this side. Something I've got to address. It's irritating, but it works great. And I've never had a problem with it. Towed with it, you're not supposed to. And the rest of this is pretty much gonna stay the same. I think we've got our propane and our kitchen system, which I'll go through in more detail later on. And then here is a rolling rack for our refrigerator that'll be in here once we're kitted out. I don't think there's anything much we have to update back here. We do have the roof rack off right now just to squeeze it into the garage because this Jeep stands at seven foot eight and I'm in a residential garage right now. So we only had a seven foot door to work with. So once we get that back up, there's a whole case and our license plate mount and stuff goes up there. I don't think we've got a lot of maintenance anyways back here. that right 
Let me dive in the underbelly and see what else we got going on. So, and a little leakage. That's looking like rear mainsail to me. Get up in here. Well, that's definitely hard to see, but I'll have to jump up in here. Change that rear main seal. Let's see if we can get rid of some of those leaks. An oil pan while we're at it. Up here, you can see a little bit of the exhaust I'm talking about. Up here at this collector on the back side of here, that's where that's cracked. And then above that is the intake. We'll pull all that off and get that switched out. This is all the Magnaflow exhaust. Back around to here. Still running a stock belly pan, which has got its consequences. <laughs> Hey there. And there's that little muffler we're going to switch out and change that one over to a little bit larger Magnaflow muffler. And still probably a turn down right there with what's going on in the rear suspension and the truss on the rear axle, which is actually behind it. Uh, there isn't a lot of room to run a tailpipe out and past how the shocks are. And back here, as we were talking about with the springs, these dual rate springs, well, they're great for when this is light and then this is all the way expanded. These springs, this top section, once the, if your suspension is drooped out, this will lift up, right, and, and expand this whole coil spacing. These will expand and then keep the coil in the bucket. We don't have that much travel. I'm on a short arm lift, and that isn't, doesn't matter whatsoever. So what we need is a stronger coil back here at a higher pound per inch that's going to keep this upright. That here's that rear truss situation I was talking about. And just how that locates everything, there's not a lot of room back here. While I'm staring at a brake drum, we can add to adjusting out the rear brake drums to set up our get our parking brake situated. And in here with the stock belly pan, these are a real pain to drain. Uh, well, this is in here, so while I've got the belly pan off to change the transmission mount in there, can I see it? Up there. We'll pop the fluid out of that transfer case and drain that. So we got back to the rear of the Jeep and got the suspension all dropped out and the springs pulled and started inspecting all the joints and what needed replacing and what was still in good shape. Which I was pretty stoked to find out that our upper control arms which we had Heim joints on, still have a 
bunch of resistance and they're still in really good shape. So that'll save us a few bucks on joints replacing those. But the problem I did run into, got a little bit of slop in the back of here. So at some point this control arm bolt came loose and wallered out this hole pretty bad. So we had a bunch of play back and forth in this control arm bracket. So we solved that. Jumped over to a CNC table and or a cutoff wheel on a flap disc. It made some little bracket or made some little plates that we can weld on to either side of that bracket. And I suppose the right thing to do would cut off this whole bracket and weld on a new bracket, but that's a lot more work and this was a few pennies in steel and time. So I've already got the other side cut out and welded up, but we're gonna stick these over to either side of the bracket, run a bolt through, grab the glue gun, and stick them on. So we got the back control arm plates and reinforcements glued in. And then I found the same thing on my rear track bar mount here. I come in and I've just got a little extra play. And any play like that where it's wallowed out, it's just gonna get worse and worse. So cut a couple more brackets and we're gonna sandwich those through either side. On the outside with the appropriate holes. and burn those on for reinforcement. So now that we've got this welded in, I got these reinforcements burned in on the back track bar mount and the uh, lower upper control arm mount for the rear axle. I'm gonna go ahead and reinstall our double adjustable upper control arm. And I went through and inspected these joints and these ones were still in good shape. So I'm gonna stick with the heim joints up on the upper control arms. I did go through and pulled out each joint, cleaned up the threads and lined the inside with a little bit of wheel bearing grease just to prevent any corrosion. So now we're gonna jump under there, get this side on the upper reinstalled so I can drop the lower and switch out our burned out joint on the lower control arm. Then while we're setting up the suspension, I'll just get all these bolts started um, and just thread it in a bit and we'll wait until the uh, weight of the rig is set down to the suspension to go around and then tighten up each bolt with the weight of the suspension sitting on it. Right here is one of the major reasons I love the double adjustable control arms. So when I'm just trying to line things up, I don't have to heave this axle all over the place. I can just use the joints and line them up. And then square up the axle later on. fashion these bolts with some hardened washers and new nylock nuts. bust off this lower control arm and I'll show you that smoke time joint down below. Oofta! Uh. 
Alright, I'm gonna give these all these mounts a little inspection. That was nice and tight, so I think we're in good shape. This joint's still nice and stiff. Oh, very. Any, who? I got the other side out of here. This lower heim joint was just completely shot. And yep, this one is too. Those upper joints still had some resistance in the spherical joint in here. And this one is just shot. And then once you get that under a load, there's enough play back and forth. Ah, you can almost I can feel it. Might be able to see it a little bit there. With that little bit of play where this is separated. That's enough. This one's shot. But this has been on here for thousands of miles. I don't know. More than 50. So it did its job. But what we're going to replace that with is the same joint that's on the other side. That was a Johnny joint. So a spherical joint uh, with rubber bushings and greasable on the inside. And that just helps keep us a little more true as well and avoid some of that oscillation that happens when everything's on heim joints. This just has so much movement that once all of this is in once all the links have that much oscillation available, you'll get that kind of motion. And this should be a little bit more restricted joint, still plenty of travel between the two in degrees of travel as we articulate the suspension up and down. But it should give us some better road manners and square up the axles and avoid that oscillation that we get going down the highway. But now I'm gonna pull both these joints out, make sure the threads are cleaned up, give them a little bit of grease, and reinstall the Johnny joint on the bottom. We've got that heim joint out of here and then cleaned up the threads on the inside of here just with a wire brush. Give it a little whirly woo just to get any of that little corrosive little surface rust. And then got the old joint greased up, new joint greased up. Uh, these don't take very much grease, and maybe a pump. Uh, and then they'll circulate the grease around as soon as the suspension starts traveling. But I'm going to get these bolted back up in here. Run down here again. It's pretty tight fitting, but I'm going to use the double double adjustable, and I'll leave the greaser pointed up. Even though I, it'll be difficult to get in there to grease it, you can use some right angle greasers and things like that. But I don't want this to snap off if I mount this down, and I could go over any rock or catch anything. It's going to snap that greaser right off. So I'll leave that pointed up, and use the adjustable. Just thread that out evenly. I started with both the joints uh, set all the way in. Bring that out to roughly where we're supposed to be at, just to get it lined up. And I'll send the bolt in. All right, on to our next set of inspection for the rear end. I'll move on to brakes and then servicing our wheel spacers too. Uh, I've run these wheel spacers for a long time and they just, they take a lot of maintenance too. You just wanna make sure you crack them loose every now and again and reapply uh, some Loctite and torque them appropriately. But we're also gonna get in here and inspect the inside of the drum and our brake assemblies and see what we've got left.
So it feels pretty tight. Yeah. Not bad, not too shabby. A little bit of brake dust. No major grooves. Have a little glazing, but it'll jump into the shoes here. And they've got plenty of material left. So now I'll come through and clean up all these studs with a wire wheel. Clean up some of this. This isn't rust on the axle shaft. This is just for coming off of the, the drum. These are a Kermali axle shaft from Yukon gear and axle. This rear end is a, a Dana Super 35 kit. So 30 spline axle shafts and uh, these are Kermalis. And it's also out onto a five and a half, uh, five on five and a half uh, lug pattern, which is a CJ lug pattern. Um, then to get the, the drums to fit, these are drilled. I had a machinist drill TJ rotors out, or TJ drums out to the five on five and a half stud pattern. But I'll just come through, clean all that up with a wire wheel, clean up the studs, give this a little spray paint powder coat, uh, make it look a little nicer. We'll clean all that up and reinstall everything. Oh, I'm not explaining anything. If you need help in the spray paint, you didn't spend enough reckless time as a teenager. But, I'm gonna hit these with some rust reforming powder coat in a can. <clears throat> Spent a lot of time out west and everything was so dry and they don't use salt on the roads. I've been back in Wisconsin for a bit and I let this sit out and just everything flash rusted. So the drums, it was never really that concerning. I didn't pay that much attention to any of it. And I'm regretting that. Brought it back here and just the salt in the air flash rusted everything. But we can clean that up. It'll work with a wire wheel and some rust tough Krylon paint. All right, now that we got all the rotors painted up and polished up, looking good. Uh, I'm gonna go through and add a little bit of Loctite on the studs here and throw our wheel spacers back on. Uh, just a little bit of blue Loctite. So not completely never come off, but uh, enough that it'll hold on through the vibrations and stuff like that. And I can still break them loose later on. So I'll add a little bit of Loctite to the studs and thread these spacers on. Hand tightening these down in a star pattern. I have a bevel on the lug nut and that'll seat. These are lug centric. I'll seat and make sure that we don't have any odd wobble, but not with an impact. Tighten these on with an impact and risk shattering the aluminum too. Give it a crack with all of the jigadigas. And torque them down. I'm gonna move on to installing these springs. As previously mentioned, I've been through a few different spring companies. We've run several different on here. 
And not everybody is great about advertising their spring rate. Um, you call up some of the off-road shops, like off-road warehouse, things like that. They can give you a little more detailed specs on a lot of the spring rates. And this is the highest spring rate that I've found so far. Um, AV, I think, or Air. Old Man Emu, I think, offers a spring that's a two and a half inch lift. That's their heavy duty. But that wasn't enough for us to keep the gas tank off and dropping through things and skidding on stuff. So I went with Clayton's. That was the, the highest spring rate I could find at 220 uh, pounds per inch. So we'll see how these do with keeping our butt off the ground. And then a four inch lift spring. So we'll see where we end up. I'm stoked. Before oh, running some different styles of springs, you either end up under sprung or trying to take up, use a taller lift spring and to achieve the height you're looking for. So if I'm using a four and a half inch spring, but I only achieve a three and a half inch height, I've got that spring really compressed. And it gives just a wicked rebound when you unload on any rock or any obstacle. All that spring force is just smacking down to the ground. And if you're running a dual rate or we, which we were, was I think a triple rate coral coil this last time around. I've got that entire top two sections smashed together already. It just doesn't ride very good, and then we're battling that uh, recoil from the springs being over compressed all the time from all the weight. So, putting this thing on a diet and shrinking some of our gear load to get down to even less than we'll fit in the TJ. So. <laughs> Um, in combination with that and this higher rate spring, I'm hoping we achieve just a nice static four inch lift height. And right now I do have a half inch, more spring isolator, a little rubber pad up here right now. Uh, Cause no matter what, I'm heavy back here. I've got a hundred pounds of Bassett to throw in here along with all the rest of our gear. So we'll see how this ends up. I'm gonna go check on the other side and then we'll move on to the track bar. All right, so we got the springs installed with relative ease. Now I got it sitting at about ride height. And we centered the axle, actually using a plumb bob that I made in my high school shop class. So that's been around for a while, still does the thing. Uh, that we just picked the common point and then measured the plumb bob down to the point on the axle, which now there's cool laser levels or lasers you can do this with too, but still works. I got the axle centered and the control arms at equal length. Uh, I can fine tune all those adjustments later on, but getting the axle centered, we can set the length of our rear track bar and then get that bolted in. All right, that looks good. and throw the frame side in first and come back over here and get the axle side. close. I don't think that's going to interfere with any of the springs, but we'll double check and I can always cut the end of that off. These all just snug in for now and then we'll do a final tighten once it jeeps under it all of its own weight. Back around to the other side of the world. See if we can get this with a little lineup tool, see if we can get things jostled around enough. Otherwise, we'll have to bust out the ratchet strap and send her home. There we 
go. I'll take that. Oh, spider. Die. Oh. 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 And 35s are heavy. We got the wheels back on and all of our joints in place and everything should be pretty accurate for our lower control arm lengths and our panhard bar and the axle set even side to side at right height. So I'm going to drop it back down to the ground and dial in our pinion angle. Now well, we're in the land down under. Took a little bit of finagling but we've got our uh, control arm lengths and our axle set at the best possible location given got some clearance some tight clearances with the back of the gas tank and the panhard bar track bar comes across here so i just had to play around with that until we've got just enough clearance i want to try and push the axle back as far as i can to get as much wheelbase as i can as we go up our wheelbase shrinks so i'm trying to push that axle back but we run into mechanical clearance issues so we were fighting that a little bit but we got those dialed in and set our pinion angle at a rough estimate. We'll get it out on the road and load it down and see if we've got any vibrations or anything like that. We can always come back and make a second adjustment real easy with the double adjustables. I don't have to unbolt anything. We can just spin those, loosen up the jam nuts, and spin that to adjust the pinion angle kind of on the fly. But I'm going to take this opportunity to run some more maintenance and grease our drive shaft back here. Uh, both the front and rear on this are Adams drive shafts. And when we lived in uh, Las Vegas, you guys were local. Um, so that was awesome. We actually did a bunch of work on this on this rig right when I first bought it. Uh, I kind of took it to him and said, well, let's, let's throw some money at this and get some preventative stuff done. Uh, and that was some, also included some drive shafts. This Jeep had seen a lot of adventure uh, before we owned it. Uh, lived part of its life uh, up in northern Nevada. It had a small lift kit on it and seen plenty of adventure, but uh, when we purchased it, I'd say nearly every joint was shot. <laughs> it needed U joints all around and front axle U joints, and you know, drive shafts are pretty smoked. But that's what we took it to them for. And these are the same drive shafts. I think I did do U-joints on the back of this at some point. But when you're greasing these shafts, you want to totally collapse them. I just did there, got some grease popping out. Fill that with grease. Now I got a little extra in there puking out. Well, these guys are great. I need drive shafts. They're awesome. This is a double carden with a slip yoke eliminator in here too. So it gives you great articulation and smooth drive line angles, not over over stressing the the, the slip yoke that comes on here. Um, we also previously had a hack and tap. Uh, so we drill out the end and. Use a different mounting solution, uh, but eventually when we had this transfer case rebuilt last time, we went to a slip yoke. 
That eliminate a lot of vibrations. Let's get this drive shaft back in. I'll tighten down some jam nuts. If I back it up a touch and adjusting that pinion angle, uh, I only install one upper control arm here. Even though I'm only I'm still spinning and I can spin both of them at the same time, but uh, avoid fighting each other. I just install one, and then you can just spin that one and, and adjust the pinion angle up and down, and then just install the other one to match. Once you've got that done, same thing. Doesn't matter if you had a single adjustable control arm; you can do the same thing. But then you're only messing around with one instead of. Both. So I got in here and knocked out the front suspension. Got the new springs in. Those are sitting nice. Checking out all the rest of the components. Got the new lower control arm joints in. New Johnny joints. Checked on the shocks. And those seem to still have pressure and aren't leaking. So good. That'll work. Then the next thing I need to do, came and also greased everything too. Just grease pulling up on that control arm and grease the rest of the joints over there. But the next thing I need to do is set an alignment, and, um, set the toe on this. So there's a couple of ways you can go about that. You're doing it right off the tires, but that leaves a lot of margin for error just between the tire manufacturer and pressure and yeah. So I came up with these. I know you can buy sets of these. And I didn't do that. Got out the cutoff wheel and made a set. So these bolt onto the hub, and then we'll run a tape measure. There's a couple bolt holes there. We'll run a tape measure, we'll bolt this one on the other side, run a tape between here and the other side, here on the other side, and then set our toe. Already got the rest of this loosened up. And this went pretty quick. So let's set this toe and on to the next project. First, I'm going to check that these tape measures are <coughs> measuring the same. Can't trust anything. And that seems to be accurate. Miracle. All right, so we'll leave this one hanging off the front. Ah. Up front, I'm at 66 and a half. In the back. About 66 and... Thirteen sixteenths. So we are way toe in at the moment. I'm gonna bring that out a bit. Looking for an eighth toe in.
I'd say that'll work. Now we got the toe set. Pop these off, so I'm poke an eyeball out. Get this back on its wheels. Set our final axle position. You can rotate those lowers, push it forward and back and check clearances. I don't know that I've ever been this impressed to see a rig sit shorter. But the springs we had on here were definitely a little bit taller, and it's nice to get this lower center of gravity down. It messed up. I should have taken some measurements before where we were sitting at, but this is significantly shorter. Um, then it's got a little bit of a rake in the back. So I have that little spacer in here, so that should help out once we add all of our gear back here and get the rooftop tent back on with our cargo box. And then as that'll squat down a little bit, it should level off at the rear. I've always had this saggy butt thing going on. So this looks like it's going to work out and we're significantly lower. I don't have as much up travel, but I'll sacrifice that for the tippy sway and we'll see how stable the springs are. Still got to get in here and straighten out the uh, steering wheel and get our track bar lined up and get the axle completely centered in here. Uh, but for now, I'm going to dive in, get the pinion together and then I'll have Chelsea help me uh, you can, there's a little trick. You can use the steering wheel to pull the body over, uh, centered on the axle. So we'll take some measurements and see where that's going to be. And then she can sit in the rig, pull the steering wheel to the side, and then that'll get the track bar centered up, uh, to get the axle centered up and then we'll place the track bar in. But I'm stoked. It's a huge step. So I had mentioned centering the axle with, uh, the steering wheel. And I'm going to do this dramatically for visual purposes, but there you can see I'm moving the body on top of the axle. So if I mess that up here for visualization and come back with the plumb bob and then we're going to dive in here and take a measurement off of a common point on the frame to the axle for reference and then we jump over to the other side and take the same measurement and see how far off we are. Let me bring you in to show what I'm talking about. This is the best way I've found to do this on this particular suspension setup. Find a common point here. Oh, weird to do one handed to get this set up the right length. But so if I get this hanging up here, it's even laying on the spring. So purposely for visuals, I've got this cocked way over to the driver's side. I'm going to come over to the other side. at the same point up top here I'm sitting right on top of the C so that tells me I need to shove this the body over axle over the other way and then we'll get that completely centered up and you can use a steering wheel to do that because right now drag link is hooked up but the panhard bar is just laying there behind the tie rod right now so if i come over to here i 
turn the wheel. Should be able to see this. See that movement? And we'll play with that enough and that plumb bob and get everything squared away and then thread the track, uh, track bar, panhar bar into the appropriate location. So I've got that squared away and <clears throat> spring looks nice and straight. Axle is centered, looking very carefully. Without shoving anything side to side, bring our pan hard bar up and thread this in to match our location. All right, so I'm back in wrenching on the undercarriage of the TJ. I got the belly pan pulled off and I had to replace its uh, torn transmission mount, which had a uh, strip stud and that was a hole to do. We got that replaced uh, and ripped the exhaust out. Got some work to do on that later. But at this particular juncture, uh, I'm draining the fluid out of the transfer case. And once you get in here, I always want to make sure that the, the fill plug is able to be removed uh, before you go and drain the fluid out of the drain plug. So I've already done that. I'm going to pull this plug out. Well, that looks good. At least it's red. This transfer case was recently rebuilt. I don't think we've got... Huh? Not bad. Looks pretty good. I don't know, maybe five, ten thousand miles on this transfer case? Probably closer to ten. But that looks pretty good. Either way, we'll go through and replace that. And on this one, I'm one royal purple on all the fluids. Uh, this one with royal purples, Max ATF. I've run there synthetics in all the boxes except the diffs. Um, the Detroit locker we've got in the back seems to like regular old mineral oil, but the rest of uh, royal purples fluids seem to hold up the best in the heat that I'm dealing with. So I'll let that drain out for a minute. I'm pretty happy with that. No metal flakes. Good rebuild job. Using a transfer pump to do this is much easier than trying to negotiate your funnel up into these tight spaces. I'm just gonna plop that one in here. Carefully. The other end up into the case. down. I don't remember what the case calls for. We'll go up to the fill plug and once it starts pouring out, call that good.
like we're there. Making a mess. Now we're back in the shop another day, addressing some leaks on the TJ. And I'm starting off with an oil pan leak. Uh, had some leaks around the edges, and then while we're in there, going to change the rear main seal while we're at it. Uh, I replaced that about 60,000 miles ago, and I think it's starting to weep again. So we're going to dive into there. Starting off, we've got the oil pan off and all cleaned up, cleaned up the edges, got a new Felpro gasket for it. And while I am working on that, Chelsea's back here getting our roof rack cleaned up. Give this thing a coat of paint, get it all roughed up. Let's get you underneath here and show you what we're working with. So we've got the oil pan off, went through and cleaned up some of the uh, the mating surfaces up here. Cleaned up all the way around the timing cover in the front. But our next step is to get in here and pull this girdle off that's attached to the bottom of the main caps. So we can gain access to this main cap right here and tap out that rear main seal. So I'm going to jump in, get that girdle off, and get the cap off. Show you some of what that looks like. And while I was under here, it seems we've got access to it. And checking out the play in our timing chain. That looks like a lot. I checked into some of the specs, and if it's less than half an inch of play, less than half an inch of deflection from here to here, which I've already measured, and that's at 3 eighths right now. So it's stretched, but I guess within reason. Here's we're going to leave that alone for now. Yeah, let me get this off of here and I'll show you what that rear main looks like. I popped off that girdle along the main caps and then came in and took out this rear bearing cap. And I'd show you what's going on in here. And right up here is where that rear main seal, it's a two piece rear main seal. And there's a little bit of RTV up there from the mating surfaces. But. Crank looks to be in good shape on that bearing anyways. And then, so we've got to drive out that seal from one side and then hook it around the top of the crank down the other. You don't want to use a um, anything metal. So either a plastic something or what I've found useful is a chopstick. I'm going to take that, get it in here, get it right on there, and then tap tap baru up and around and knock that out. And then in the bearing cap, I can show you that in here. You can get a look at our bearing. It's tough to see on camera, but it looks like there's some grooves, but if I run my finger across it, there's nothing that catches my fingernail. So we're in pretty good shape there. And then this is the other half of the rear main seal. And here you can just start at one side and you know, pick that up, grab onto it with a plier and, and yank that out. So I'm gonna get busy, knock this seal out, clean it up lube up the new one and get the bottom end of this sealed up. It's so under the rear main seal reinstallation. This bottom seal comes out pretty easy. You just kind of peel that out. And the orientation of this lower one is hard to mess up because you've got these keyways, these reliefs in here. So this one we can just lube up with a little bit of oil onto here and then set that into place. I've already got that cleaned up pretty good on the inside. Uh, mating surfaces as clean as I can get them. 
Then once we get a little oil on that, we'll just press that down into here with these little ears matching up with those. All right. Now, once you get underneath and get the top half of the rear main seal in, that one, you just need to make sure that this little lip, see that, and there's some hashing on there. So this lip right here is faced towards the front of the engine. Then that one will go around on the top. That's kind of how we'll seat it in from there. And we'll just slowly bring that around and push it by hand, also with a little bit of oil on it. Push that by hand. And then in the in your seal kit should be this little shoehorn. So in the it's hard to show you underneath, so I'll show you on this one. But this will line up like so in the top half underneath the vehicle. Tuck that in there. Then tuck your rear main in. And then start pushing that all the way around. And then by the time you get maybe half, two thirds around, you'll have to come back in with a chopstick and tap ever so gently on this end and get that seated all the way around. So I'm gonna jump underneath, get this one tapped in, get this one seated. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, when it's all flat uh, with the bottom of the lock underneath. Now we're back in the land down under. And here's how that little shoehorn goes in. Just pop that in on the edge and then just start the seal. And this is lubricated. But that shoehorn will stop from ripping the edge of the seal on the rough surface of the block. So then from here, I'm gonna guide it with two hands. It's gonna be tough to show you with one. You can just kind of maneuver, oh, there we go. Maneuver that around. You can see there, about a third of the way in. Just keep shoving that in. And then once it gets to a point, uh, you might have to grab the chopstick again and tap tap once it's back over here. And then make sure that that sits flush with the block surface here and on this side. You can always tap back and forth if you go too far. Just be very gentle on the edge of the seal. Yeah, it's not to rip it. But I'm going to finish wrapping this up, and we'll get the bearing cap back on. With a little dab of RTV on the ends on the bearing cap side. But I'll show you that up top. So we've got both halves of the rear main seal installed into their appropriate components, the other half underneath in the block in this, in this bearing cap. I'm gonna take a small dot of RTV and plop that right here and right here at those mating surfaces where there might be a little bit of indifference. And then reinstall this bearing cap, seat that, torque the main cap bolts to 80 foot-pounds, get the girdle back on, and on goes the oil pan. Another job marked off the list. But I've seen a few different ways to go about that. And this one has been the best. It's worked for me so far. Chelsea got this whole roof rack all scuffed up and cleaned up. Got some of the little rust chunks and stuff knocked off yesterday. Uh, going through and giving a little spritz of a new coat. Uh, I'm going to hit some of the spots first with this rust stuff, uh, rust reformer. So anywhere where it's a little bit of, a little rusty, bare metal, um, over here is a few chunks from where we 
are always jumping up here with our feet. So I'm going to come through and hit a bunch of those low spots with the, the rust to just stop that in its tracks. And then I like using uh, farm and implement paint. So it's got really good coverage, it's a nice shine, and it can be applied direct to bare metal. So it's a great um, kind of catch-all. I paint the axles with this stuff and uh, yeah, works well. We've already got a few of the, the uprights and stuff for the roof rack painted over here and it looks great. I'm going to come through and hit these with a, a second coat and get this all covered up. That's not just for looks too, we want to protect this a little bit, so I'm going to get a couple good coats of paint on it, so it prevents some chips and make everything last a little longer. Spending so much time in the West, I didn't really have to be concerned with rust, it just wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, not a lot of moisture and things like that, and so you get a spot that wears through, it just really wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, however, returning to the Midwest, in Wisconsin specifically, there is so much salt on the roads, it just ends in the air and everything. So this, everything on this flash rusted in, I don't know, a week of being here. So just trying to clean this up and yeah, stop that from happening. It's definitely some challenges regionally, depending on where you are. Out on the coast, it's the salt from the ocean. That'll settle on the hoods and anything that's exposed, the sun beats them pretty good out there. And the salt just comes out of the air, rot the hood and the roof, any exposed frame components. Here in Wisconsin and in the rust belt in general, kind of seems to be the, just what eats vehicles. salt the roads and just gets into every crevice. There's no getting away from it. The chemicals in this stuff should stop it where it's at. And there's some low spots from doing that. Not that I'm really that concerned about how this looks, but this will fill in those spots a little bit. And then we'll top coat it essentially with the farm and implement paint. Which sounds like I'm getting to the end of this. I don't have to be good enough. All right, well, I'm gonna hit the uprights with another coat. Give this a coat. We'll check back and show you what it looks like. So the big reason I like doing spray paint for anything that gets really used uh, off-road, in general, um, even fenders and stuff for that matter, you can touch this up, you know, a little bit of sandpaper if you have to, and knock it down, whatever, you get a chip in it, you take a rock, it doesn't really matter. You know, a few bucks at the parts store and, and you can fix this right up. Whereas, and I've used both of what I'm talking about here, even a textured coating, uh, this is a Raptor liner, and just over time it's going to chip. So like a Raptor liner or a powder coat, both of those, as they chip, there's nothing I can do about this. You know, there's nothing I can maybe get a little Raptor liner and try and daub it in there. I, yeah, I'm not doing that. And same thing with the powder coat. Once that starts to chip, it's just going to continue to chip. You can spray paint it or whatever, but it's just going to continue to crack and chip underneath. Whereas this, you've worn through a little spot in the paint, clean it up, and good as new. And this, I can come through and, you know, that, just to get rid of the, the, the rusty parts and whatever's dinged through, but there's nothing I can do to kind of actively repair that. So that's just why I prefer using a spray paint, and it leaves it kind of serviceable, I guess. And cheaper. Powder coat's not cheap, and these Raptor liner coatings, Linex, stuff like that, also really expensive and really heavy. So I've resorted back to the spray can. 
seems to work the best. If you're really using your stuff, you know, your pickup truck or Jeep, it's gonna take scratches. It's gonna take rock dings and just all kinds of junk. So I figure why not have an easy way to patch it up and have it look nice again. Anyways, just reasons why I'm a fan of spray rattle canning, spray painting a lot of these parts. So in the beginning, we were talking about adding some more water storage to this, and previously we've carried a jerry can behind my seat, and then we had four gallons of water in roto packs up on the cage. Um, and in order to distribute some of the weight forward and lifting the jerry can in and out behind my seat is a pain. So we reached out to roto packs and grabbed a couple extra of their cans and mounts, and I'm thinking about that will be nice. We'll add two gallons to each side, giving us four gallons in total in roto packs, which is not bad. Uh, yeah, so we'll pop a couple holes in here and attach these up front and get some of the weight off the rear. And I like it, this is the new black ones. I had a little bit of algae growth stuff with the white ones. We'll see how that goes in here. Now let me pop a couple holes in, get going. So to install these brackets uh, that come with the roto packs, flush mount these up here. So I drilled a couple holes into the body here. There's nothing behind that, just kind of a dead space. Uh, I'm going to use these riv nuts. Uh, so I've never used one of these before. It's that little ferrule, I guess. Uh, this is a riv nut setting tool. And then as I apply pressure back on both of these, this will crimp this fitting to the sheet metal and sandwich it in between. A little extra sealant. Add just a tickle of RTV. Around each of these holes. The rib nuts are a great way to install stuff onto a body. It's also how our fridge slide is mounted into the floor in the back of the Jeep. Come back and clean that up later. But. Just insert that into the hole. Make sure it's flush. Uh, equal pressure. Uh, and then you'll feel it bottom out. Release that pressure. Unthread the tool. Now we've got a nice mounting surface into the sheet metal. I need to mount these up, mount the mounts to the body, and I'm using some stainless hardware so we don't get rust, but I'm mounting that into this uh, probably zinc coated rib nut. So there's two metal indifferences, especially with stainless, and that little bit of anti-seize uh, will help with the grip. And so we don't get any fusion later on, have this hermetically sealed to itself in there, should I ever need to remove it. Also use a little bit of double-sided 3M uh, and a foam tape on the back side of here. Because of that riv nut, there's a little bit of uh, protrusion from the flat side of the body and I can't stand rattles. 
So just to, not to protect the body, but to stop that from rattling it all back and forth and give us a little extra stick in place. Just added a few pieces of tape behind there. All right, let's check some final fitment. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. Nice. And I misspoke earlier, this will give us an additional four gallons, so we'll have eight gallons in total of water in the jugs, and then we always carry some drinking beverages and things like that in the refrigerator too. And a couple of large water canteens. So, but eight gallons, that's a, that'll be pretty sweet. Let's see how long we can make that last. You know, button up the other side. Morning. Well, today we're after checking off another item on the Jeep's rehab list here. And today, that endeavor entails the exhaust. Um, these four liter, the exhaust manifolds are notorious for cracking. Yeah, and this one's cracked a couple times, I've welded it back up. Uh, it's cracked again. So, uh, we're gonna replace it. Uh, that's pretty involved on these engines. Um, this being the intake and exhaust are on the same side, so we have to remove all of that to just get access to the exhaust manifold. Uh, so last night I came in and pulled all the electronics, pulled all the connectors off the injectors, off the throttle body, removed the intake, or uh, air cleaner. So we've got that all prepped to go. I went around with some deep creep and soaked all of the, the uh, studs and bolts going into the head, so hopefully those come off with ease, so that's the plan. And I also came in and got rid of the radiator. I had found a little crack in that, uh, not a crack, a separation between the plastic tank and the uh, uh, aluminum housing, so it could just be all the vibrations over the years. Uh, but we picked up another radiator and got that out of the way so that we can get in and get some access to the nuts and bolts in here. But, let me show you what we're replacing this with. Bam! Looks pretty good. At least I think so. So this one's definitely more of a header design than the manifold that's on it. Um, the manifold that's on it just kind of has straight tubes coming down and then it's all joined into one pipe collector and kind of comes down. They're all cracked. Um, and another issue that I've ran into with uh, this particular engine design with the exhaust and intake on the same side is heat soak. You get a, a ton of heat off the exhaust and then that pulls up into the intake and gets everything just super hot, gets the intake temperatures really hot. Uh, so I went ahead and got this wrap, uh, I think this is from Design Engineering Inc, and this is their titanium wrap. So it does have a little bit of fibers, uh, but it's nothing like the fiberglass. Uh, it's, it's different. Um, I believe it's a titanium and volcanic rock uh, material. But I went through and wrapped the headers up and down, some steel clamps on there. Yeah. So I'm excited. Maybe that'll bring down our inside engine temps and bring down the intake temperatures. But in order to gain access to that, we had to remove a lot. So we're going to start by pulling off the power steering pump. Like I said, I already got the rad and the shroud out of the way so I can get a little more access in here. And all the connectors. And then we'll start pulling all this off, remove the intake and the exhaust. Get the new one bolted back up. Oh, we nabbed that intake off. I'll jump in and show you what that looks like down the intake runners. That's that other style manifold. And these are just a carboned up. Down there, it's kind of hard to see. Let's see, yeah. Oh, 
pop the exhaust manifold out. Oh, those bottom bolts are tricky. Probably hard to see, but this one blew apart right around the weld right down here. It's cracked all the way around there. And it's already cracked a few times and we welded it back up a couple times. So you just got pretty brittle down there. So previously we had this small MagnaFlow muffler on here and well it sounded rowdy and I'm all about that. The drone was killing me. Uh, so we swapped that out for another MagnaFlow muffler, just a little bit larger and it's quieted down the tone quite a bit. And it was a nice fit. It's tight in there, but it fit nice. Then we just welded on a little turn down on the back of it and our hanger up to the tub and painted that weld. We'll avoid some rust. Here's another major improvement we made in the exhaust system. I'll show you this from down under. It was being shared with the intake. You can't see much from up top. Uh, but this was a, a tubed header and that we wrapped in a titanium exhaust wrap. Uh, it was titanium and volcanic rock as a material. Uh, a little bit different than the traditional fiberglass. And we wrapped all those tubes and then down to the collector there. And that has made a huge difference with the intake temperatures. Um, I think that's really going to eliminate the heat soak in some of the injectors and it's had a noticeable reduction in heat and noise. We'll see how long that lasts, but I'm stoked so far. I think we're down to one of the last items on our maintenance list here. That's some changing out the diff fluid. I drained this out last night and cleaned it up and we had installed some new axle shafts a little bit ago. Yeah, and so anytime there's new parts wearing on each other, there's a little bit of material that wears off. So there was just a tiny bit of flaky material. Tiny bit. I'm not concerned. Wear pattern looked pretty good. But I am documenting this. That I am filling this differential right now. I've got a history with that. There's another video. But it was very costly. So here it is. I'm filling the differential. But, and while this is directly in my eyeballs, looks like we've had a few very close calls on this gas tank. We got a little ripple here. Some pretty good crunches on some rocks. I have to look into those solutions in the future. Need a gas tank skid, something like that. Not leaking yet. Uh, wow, that was a lot. We made it through a lot of maintenance on this rig. It needed it. It's seen a lot of adventure, and it was good to run through the paces and really get through this thing from tip to tail. But if we run down our list from earlier, see what we made it through and if I'm missing anything. So we did plugs. We addressed the steering with new tie rods and straightened everything up and on alignment. We've got brand spanking new Milestar tires on here and a new set of springs from Clayton Off-Road. So that'll hopefully stiffen up our ride and then help with all the weight we've got going on. Um, also uh, threw in a rear track bar from Clayton as well. Keep things straight and square in the back. Uh, new Johnny joints, Rock Jock, and that should square up and improve our ride from those, from those uh, Heim joints that we were oscillating so much. Uh, we've changed out all the fluids in the rig improve the exhaust, transmission mount, rear main seal, oil pan, gasket, checked our rear brakes. See, I've got a parking brake on here. We'll address that in our final nut and bolt before we hit the road. I'll adjust that out so we get the right tension. I did throw in some turn signals off camera. I had some pretty uh, 
dim lights up here in the fenders. So I just wired in a couple different uh, brighter turn signals up front. And a new radiator as well. That had cracked along one of the plastic tanks to the actual radiator. So we replaced on that while we were in messing around with the exhaust and the intake. And the one thing we didn't get to is the heater core. That one, will it's just a big four-wheeler. I'm all right with that. We've got heated seats and we'll go with that. It's been like that for years. A long time. <laughs> But a caveat with that is this has a cage in it from Poison Spider, and I need to pull that cage to get the dash out. So I just don't have the facilities here to, or the time to do that right now. So we'll still go with the big four-wheeler and, and the seated heats and forgo our heater core for the time being. But we made it through quite a bit, and I am very satisfied with how this rig turned out. And on the next one... We'll take you through how we upfit this from all the maintenance we've done and getting this ready to go just as the Jeep as it sits. And in the next one, we'll bring around all the equipment and how we outfit this whole rig uh, for our overland adventure coming up and how we're going to live out of this thing full time. Between the rooftop tent, our kitchen, refrigerator, uh, different water capacities and fuel and how we load all that out. But for now, let's jump in this thing and take it for a shakedown drive. Thanks for watching. We'll see you down the road. already a huge difference in the exhaust. Still has a little bit of tone. See how it is after the muffler burns in and get some of that fiberglass working. But I can hear you so much better already. <laughs> See <Sorry>. less, huh? <laughs> the ride is a lot more controlled. I'm liking the springs. None of that hover feeling like I did with the, the heim joints on the front. So that's pretty cool. It's very smooth.